one wrong move, things can go bad for you. And ultimately, you know. It was actually very humbling and amazing to see how many friends and how much of an effect she had on people in such a short time in, in our own community here. I think about her all the time whenever we go out biking, about the possibilities and anything can happen at any time. And, but I don't let it ruin it for me, you know. I don't, uh, like I'm not going to stop biking. Well, heck, it's looking a little more like maybe I'm going to be able to stay in the trailer on weekends maybe. So I can get that gold and maybe I can get back to living in the woods, even, you know, with mobility issues. You know, and my goal was always to do that, and I sort of gave up on that a little with the mobility. Now, as I've started uh, rehabbing it closer and closer, it's seeming in my mind starting to go, this might be possible, this is a good challenge, this is something I can do. We dated a little bit as much as you date in grade eight. <laughs> and, and then we broke up <laughs> and we started dating again in grade 12. And we were together ever since grade 12. What was it about the sport that appealed to him? I think just like most guys, toys, <laughs> goes fast, yeah. something fun. He just loved to fix things, take things apart. He was constantly taking things apart and trying to fix them and make things move. He did have two favorite teams. He was a huge Red Wing fan and a Raiders fan. We talked to him once a week, you know, a couple, you know, couple times a month. And, uh, you know, I'd phone him, he'd phone me. And, you know, sometimes just for jokes and all that kind of stuff. You know, he's a big Red Wing fan and I was a big Leaf fan, you know, so, you know, playing jokes on each other. So I told him, I said, you know, Daryl, you, you, you got to watch yourself in these ATVs, you know, because one wrong move, things can go bad for you. And ultimately, you know. What did he say? I, I, you know what, Daryl, when you, when you talk to Daryl, Daryl was always joking. And he said, you know, don't worry about it, kid. Everything is good. Everything's good. Eh? So, and, you know, I remember one time he sent me a picture of the ATV with, uh, and my mom was sitting on it, you know, from the, from the, from the garage, so. And then he went out on the trails for a few hours. And when he was done, he went back to Wheatley River to his friends. He walked, I don't know, they were watching something, chatting. Um, they had a, just a couple of drinks. He called my son, see if he'd come pick him up. He said he was gonna go put it away in the barn. So he jumped on it, thought he'd do a quick spin, I guess, around the house. Did a spin around the house, lost control and hit a tree when he, went to put it away, <clears throat> that he was just going to put it in the barn, so he didn't put his helmet on. Okay. Um, Where normally he would, he always wore his helmet, but because he was just going around the house, right. he thought it would be safe. And uh, that's, that's me, and that's my uh, youngest brother, Daryl. It was probably about 1, 1 30 in the morning, and uh, I woke up and I went downstairs to get a drink of water and the phone was there. So I picked up the phone and I hit it and I seen all these voice messages and, and text and one was from Carrie and it said, uh, it, it told me, it said, phone me ASAP. So it was, it was 1, 1 30 in the morning and which would, would have been 3 or 4 30 in, in, in the morning in PEI. So, as soon as, as soon as I, I read it, I said, my mom passed away. I know there's something wrong with my mom. And, uh, and I phoned her and <laughs> that's what happened. So she told me he died. As 
not easy, that's for sure. It's well, when you're with someone for 31 years. Like, you, it's hard to find out who you are without them. So, but we may, you know, I believe everything happens for a reason. I really do, or I couldn't get up every day. And I mean, my kids are great. We're all very tight. I have, like, the best friends in the world. So, you know, we're making it through. And, you know, it's, I definitely miss them every second of every day. But... But in a quiet way, like she wasn't the loudmouth kid, but she wasn't shy or anything, just sort of the quiet. Remind me a lot, very much of my, my husband's demeanor, very kind of quiet, easygoing, um, great student, uh, kind of an old soul. She did eat, breathe, live, everything was about synchronized figure skating. So she did her test skating to keep up her skills and to get better in order to make the higher level uh, synchronized skating teams. So that's kind of her pure and true love was synchronized figure skating as a sport. And she started that when she was about five years old. I remember putting her in and uh, she had like little snaggle tooth that she wouldn't pull out. And the whole season, this thing was dangling, just barely hanging on and the kids where, you know, the older girls and stuff were kind of teasing her a lot and she just thought that was, you know, no, it's not ready to come out. And there's Elizabeth and Emma. She had hours and hours and hours of experience on the machines. Emma's driving. Um, she, it wasn't, I don't believe it was a question of experience um, with her driving, in particular. Emma? It could be with a lot of, a lot of kids, um, but I don't think that was the case in our particular circumstance, I guess. Bottom line is, if she was wearing a helmet, she would have lived. She would have had one broken rib, according to the uh, coroner's report. So she had blunt force trauma and, you know, I mean, there was instant de death. What are you doing? It's like when you get in your car, even though you're going two blocks, everyone puts their seatbelt on now, right? It's a habit. It's, it's ingrained. And we made the mistake of thinking that it was ingrained and it was a habit and that they would wear that helmet or she would wear that helmet um, automatically and maybe it should be ne needed by us to be, have been re reiterated. Because I have to say we were a very safety conscious um, ATV family. This is part of the team's uh, healing for... Uh, After she passed away in July, of course, the skating season started up in October. Her Riverview team did a memorial um, skating program to her and the support when we got to nationals was unbelievable. So our team, the little Riverview team that was doing the memorial in front of a packed house and all these green uh, tissue papers come out, lime green, the whole crowd, like just as a support to the team, like we're sorry you lost this teammate, and so it just warms your heart, you know, that that she had that kind of effect on on people and how people come together from it, you know. I think that everybody feels a little bit invisible, invincible. Like you think it'll never happen to you, even as especially when you're young, you're invincible and you don't you don't really think things too clearly, you're not as cautious as, as maybe adults are, you know, or older people.
he was very outdoorsy. Like, he was, like, there was never a time when he was not doing something outdoors. It was either, like, on Skidoo, on South by Side. He was a very avid hunter, so he'd be, like, gone at the crack of dawn trying to go moose hunting or duck hunting or fishing or... Well, Carly was four, it's our daughter. She was mm-hmm. four going on five when he passed away. But even still, like, if he took her, he'd go on the bike and he'd take her out, like, fishing or berry picking or anything to do with outside, he'd take her and he was gone. like a huge snowbank like that's where the snow obviously comes around a corner so he was trying to take the skidoo park it on top of the snowbank at the time and from what I think happened when he tried to park it on top of the snowbank the skidoo turned over on top of him and he hit his head on the concrete no he would not bother to wear his helmet probably 60% of the time unless I harped at him too so not in town but if he was going out yes he would and I know it was hard on Carly too she was only like four going on five so she didn't quite understand either so she'd be like you know where's dad and I'm like well you can't really see dad right now (laughs) you know so I mean like she's four what do you say to a four-year-old like you know dad I had to tell her like dad he's gone to heaven you know so she's like oh okay cool can I go see dad and I'm like no not right now <laughs> like it's it's hard I'm not sure if it was the dust or if it was the sun in the eyes, or or I, I really, I can't remember, because by the time I came to a stop, I just knew there was, my back was, there was something wrong, because I could hardly move, and the pain was excruciating, and then chest trauma, and then whatever else I had, that's all I know, like it was just, just like that. You know, it happened so fast. Then I ended up finding out that uh, Randa never made it, so, I mean, that made it even worse. And then waiting for the ambulance to get there, the pain, the the nut, the, you know, the whole situation. It was not a good day. Randa was a special person. Um, Kind-hearted, good-natured, funny. Um, Randa had a lot of friends, and they were all good friends. I said... Have lots of fun, I said, stay safe. I love you, Randa. She said, I love you too, Mom. The last words I said to my daughter. It started out early in the morning. You know, we were all pumped, ready to go. You know, uh, I kind of remember like bits and pieces of it, like when I look back. I mean, you know, we were all just having a good day. Nobody was, you know, like, drunk or anything like that. It wasn't like a drinking and driving type of thing, but um, when the accident happened, I didn't actually see what happened. They were two bikes in front of us, so, and it was like a lot of dust in the air, and... We were going down like a, a good dirt road, going around 50 or 60, you know, not fooling around. The sun was in our faces so I stayed back and the dust was pretty high that day and I'm not sure what happened at that point but I come up over that knoll and it was like a a sharp turn and kind of a slope and all I remember is that's pretty much all I remember I think it it rolled I think it lost control and rolled and it I don't the bike went flying like when I looked there was like broken tree branches and it, they were up high. So it almost looked like the bike, I don't know, it, it just went, it rolled, yeah. I think she broke her neck. They said that she died instantly. And 
Uh, I thought that I had felt a pulse from her when I checked her pulse. And then when I checked again, there was nothing, but they said that there, it was nothing. They said she died instantly. But she hit the top of that tree. He must have hit below. You could see where it's all broken below and broken above. Excuse me. And they come down and got the ditch here and a bike threw them off there and a bike wound up over that side of the road. It went up in the tree though. No. Yeah. Yeah, you can see where the tree and that corner. Come by just after it happened. Corner told me she hit that tree and broke her neck. Oh, she might have went up and did that. Yeah. Yeah. But the bike, he come around here too fast, and he slid down in the ditch. And when he did, he overcorrected the steering, and the bike wound up over here, and she wound up right there. You know, this sight really makes me sad, and uh, I'm gonna try not to cry. because I know that's where she laid. You know, and I, it was always in my mind, you know, uh, did she call for me? You know, I wasn't here to comfort her. I wasn't here to hold her. So this is really more difficult than going to the grave site, you know, to the cemetery. I can handle that, but this is more because you just, I just visualize her laying there, you know. I really get upset because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, one stupid mistake, one not paying attention or like going too fast, that took my daughter away from me, you know. I took my dreams of her. Just a loss of control. I was going back on a trail to a camp at a neighbor's house. And uh, I was, as I was going back there, I saw it was just, it was a loose ground. I was on there and then I lost control in the loose ground. The wheels turned, you see the ATV turned, the handlebars are bent. And I was thrown over the handlebars onto the ground. The way that someone described the helmet and the injuries, I hit a branch with my helmet when I came over the front and that pulled my head back. So I broke uh, four vertebrae in my upper spine in the C-section, the cervical spine. So I broke C1, C3, C4, and C5. And then I uh, ragdolled from the edge of the, into the woods, and I hit some rocks in my lower back and broke four, four vertebrae. I became a physiotherapist in 1982, okay. so All right. a mere 36 years. <laughs> uh, yeah, how often do you work with people who are injured uh, on snowmobiles and ATVs? Um, I would say um, there's usually always somebody on my caseload who's been injured by an ATV or snowmobile injury or accident. How serious are their injuries? Um, they range, but usually if you're seeing me, you've had spinal cord damage. So then that's usually when it's a serious injury. He just really wants to get back in the, the woods. He wants to get back to the water. Um, so it's part of our therapy to make sure that he's safe in getting out there. And even though we're not a rural area, but we just, like you saw earlier, we go outside and, and walk on our grass or go up hills and do the best we can. You realize soon enough, you're not a piece of China. You want to do the same things other people do and it doesn't change what you love you know I still love the woods I still love the trails I still love you know developing my property and clearing and all in woods so that hasn't changed so I can still do it 
know, go for it. You don't change who you are. You just became handicapped. I just went back down there where I had my accident back to my property about uh, three weeks ago. On the weekend, the first time, I drove back in the woods. It's about four kilometers off the 217, the Digby Neck Highway, and back into the woods, pulled up as far as I could from my property, got out and walked to the edge of the, edge of the, it was basically a cliff, overlooks the ocean, you're 400 feet up. You know, I got my walker out where I could get it, turned it around, sat down and looked and just breathed in that sea air and looked around, you know, there's a fishing boat was going by in the St. Mary's Bay and I'm going, yeah, this is, this is it, this is what I want to be, I'm not, I want to be, this is why. financially becoming disabled, you aren't going to have the same earning potential you had before you're going to have it. those things. And, you know, there's no good time for bad things to happen. And financially to have some of that backing knowing, okay, that's going to be covered. That's going to be covered. It's just good to know. Okay. You have those things and bad things are going to happen. I know a lot of people with ATVs and anything else, they, they forgo insurance and things like that. You know, it's something important to make sure you're registered, make sure you're licensed, make sure you're insured, make sure you wear your helmet. Getting back closer to the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. How do you yeah. feel right now? Good, great. Especially I'm breathing a little deeper because I exerted myself, I was able to do that. Yeah, it's a little, every time I do something a little new, it's a little bit of victory, you know? When I first bought my motorcycle, I had no experience on it, so I, I went and paid, did a course. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I did. I learned a lot of things on, on the course about, you know, uh, about riding motorcycles, you know, what, what to do and what not to do, and, you know, how to handle machines and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, obviously it, 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 was, it was great training for me. And, I mean, for ATVs, I don't think there is training. Uh, but, you know, if there, if there was and, and, you know, if it saves a life, then, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that the training, you've accomplished something. So, you know, so people wouldn't have to go through what we went through. Yeah, I can't imagine how it would hurt. I think it would only be a benefit. Yeah. Why do you think it would be good? Well, I think knowledge is power. Like, I think you need, the more you know, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to do it, but if you know it, you may. But it's going to change. It's, it's going to change, but how many more people are going to die before it changes? That's what I want to know. How many more?